Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, allowing Vulcan to come speak to you guys today. It's uh, going to be a pleasure. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, apologize. I'll, I'll pronounce a lot of your process words wrong. Uh, it's, I've got quite a southern dialect, so bear with me. Let's see if we can figure this out. All right. Uh, today, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to who Vulcan Material, uh, who we are, how we, where we operate, and how we operate. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about sustainability in terms of how it relates to Vulcan, how we operate our quarries. Um, in terms of safety, environmental stewardship, land use, reclamation, things of those nature. And then I'm going to give you a, an update on where we stand on the Black Point Quarry Project in Marine Terminal. All right. Uh, we currently operate approximately 342 aggregate facilities located across the warm areas of the United States, if you will. Uh, we operate coast to coast, uh, California all the way up into Pennsylvania. We've got, uh, like I said, 300 plus aggregate facilities, approximately 100 or so uh, yards facilities. Those are located uh, primarily along the Gulf Coast. Um, if you're familiar with southern geology, below the fall line. All those materials are either transported to the Gulf Coast via Mexico, you see down the Yucatan Peninsula there, or we will use rail and or barge from areas such as North Alabama, Kentucky, uh, and Tennessee areas. Uh, we employ over 7,000 people, again, scattered throughout uh, seven, eight now, eight divisions as of about two, three weeks ago. Uh, we have regional offices located uh, going from west to east in Glendale, which is Los Angeles, a uh, large one there in San Antonio, Birmingham, which is where I live, which is also the corporate office. Uh, we have one in Atlanta, Jacksonville, Knoxville, and Winston-Salem. Those are the, the big offices that we have. Um, we're publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, as of a little last year, we had a market cap of around $7.7 .7 billion. Uh, we have roughly 15 billion tons of reserves available to us that are proven. Uh, we also are a major producer of asphalt and concrete. That is primarily in markets such as California uh, and Northern Virginia and Texas. Recently, we sold 70 to 80 uh, aggregate or asphalt facilities in Florida. Uh, we sold them all to Argos, which is a South American uh, cement company. All right, I'm going to highlight just one of our bigger operations because I think it's applicable to Nova Scotia because this is essentially what we're proposing to do here. This is our Calica operation. Uh, if you've ever been to uh, Playa del Carmen or Cancun, Cozumel, uh, more than likely you got off the cruise ship at our marine terminal there. That's where we unload the material. Um, it's our largest operation. It does approximately 12 million tons a year. Uh, all that material. There is a small local market, but uh, majority of that material goes anywhere from Brownsville, Texas, through the New Orleans markets, uh, over to Tampa, and all the way back around to Jacksonville, Florida. We operate three Panamax size ships. These are 70,000 deadweight ton ships. Uh, they're all self-unloading. All right. So let's move on just quickly to sustainability at Vulcan. Uh, I think just about like any mining company in this room that uh, you, you uh, want to uh, operate in a sustainable manner, uh, it creates value for your shareholders and your stakeholders. Uh, we do this uh, with a variety of methods uh, in a responsible manner, doing it both uh, environmentally, socially, and economically. Um, this benefits, obviously, our shareholders, uh, but it benefits so many other folks too, our employees, our communities. Um, contractors, suppliers, the neighborhoods in which we operate. All right, so what does that sustainability really mean? Well, think about it from this perspective and the way we think about it is how do we go from a farm in 1950 in central Illinois to getting the permits, beginning operation, to operating it in a sustainable and efficient manner, while at the same time understanding this mining is essentially an interim land use. So. You know, in all of our sites, we're, we're always looking further down the road. Uh, we're, we're not to the picture on the right right now. We're still in the picture on the left. But, you know, those discussions have already begun. And, you know, that, that helps us in terms of selling our activities to the communities and as well to the regulators. Safety is obviously our number one priority. Uh, our goal is always zero uh, injuries, illnesses, sicknesses, violations. You name it, uh, and I think that's probably a standard that we all live to. But uh, at Vulcan, it's uh, it's quite unique that uh, of those 7,000 people, um, at any job site, any single person, it doesn't matter if you're the guy on the shovel, uh, you have the ability and the right to stop stop the project if you think it's unsafe. Um, I, I find that uh, a pretty important thing that uh, I've seen it happen many times where 
you know, something may be broken or hanging loose and, you know, they'll stop the whole operation just to fix that one thing. So uh, I find that very commendable. Environmental stewardship. Uh, Vulcan has in place uh, numerous environmental professionals located throughout the company and in the corporate office. Uh, these guys are provided every tool that you can imagine in terms of uh, documentation, uh, methods, resources to, to do things in an environmentally sound manner. Um, this is just an example of, of one that this is in San Antonio, on the north side of San Antonio. Uh, if you're familiar with San Antonio, that they rely on the Edwards Aquifer uh, for most of the water south of that area. Um, very critical to them. Water is a, a very scarce resource. And so back in 1999, Vulcan uh, essentially implemented a closed loop system um, that recycles approximately 70% of the water, which is quite amazing considering we do use quite a bit of water. Um, you know, these environmental things obviously will, will generate awards, but that's not why you do them. Um, but it's nice to see that once you do these type of activities that uh, those things are recognized. This is another very important program to us. These are photos from our Inca quarry, which is uh, just west of Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Vulcan has over 40, has 42 certified national uh, wildlife habitat sites across North America. These range all the way from California all the way up into the Maryland area. Uh, they're anywhere from hard rock sites to sand and gravels. Um, they're very unique in the terms that uh, these exist not in, in coexistence with mining. So uh, we may have, say, 500 acres where a couple hundred acres is dedicated to these wildlife habitats. Uh, the sites are maintained typically by the, those employees who work on the site. Um, obviously, we have to go through recertification each year for these facilities. Um, but we're very proud of that. Um, we, we think this is the right thing to do. Land reclamation. Uh, this is a photo of um, outside of Fresno, California. This is a former Rank Island. It's a sand and gravel operation, approximately 300 acres. Uh, it provides habitat for over 175 species of wildlife, 136 species of birds. Um, it's actually a very pretty, beautiful place. Um, but this was done during the reclamation and during the mining process. So, you know, this, this end use was already in mind. Um, and as well, if you're familiar with environmental regulations in California, this goes a long way to allowing you to operate. And again, award. Um, we received a reward from uh, the Department of uh, Conservation there for this reclamation effort. Community outreach is huge at Vulcan. Uh, you know, and I think you guys would all agree that, uh, you know, it, you have to be active and supportive of your community. Um, and then you will become a trusted corporate part partner with them. Uh, we do everything from uh, charitable events. Uh, I know myself, I, I do probably 12 to 15 talks each year to local schools, Boy Scouts, uh, take tours of our quarries. Uh, we participate in uh, one of the largest things that we do, which is pretty neat, is uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, there's a place called Ruffner Mountain. Uh, if you've ever been to Central Park, New York City, this park is actually bigger. Um, but it's an old mining site, and so we, Vulcan allows our employees, and usually every, once, uh, every couple months, uh, you'll find 20 to 50 employees out there working the day to remove privet, uh, build birdhouses, whatever. Um, but these are the activities that we do in terms of community outreach. Another community program I want to just uh, touch on quickly, and we talked about Cancun or, or uh, uh, Kalika earlier. But during the development of that site back in the 80s, uh, uncovered Mayan ruins there. And so we took the steps to preserve those ruins. Um, if you ever are uh, in Playa del Carmen, I highly recommend you stop by. There's a little parking area off the side of the road, and you can actually walk through those, uh, those ruins. It's pretty neat. Open houses. We do a lot of open houses. Uh, if any of you have kids, uh, uh, I know my son, I've taken him to a handful, especially when he was much younger, that uh, we climbed up. I can't tell you how many times we climbed up and down the 100-ton uh, dump trucks. Uh, they love it. We just recently, uh, actually last Friday, uh, had an open house at, in Gurley, Alabama, which is in the northeast corner. We uh, opened up a new quarry there, uh, had an open house, had a barbecue competition, and we also um, dedicated a uh, outdoor classroom to the Gurley Elementary School, which is about a mile and a half down the road. One of the topics in terms of education that we really do, and it's a really strong point of Vulcan, is that we have over 286 adopt-a-school programs. Um, 
think about that, we have 340 some odd sites, 286 adoptive schools, that just about everybody's got a school nearby. Um, those are really important to us. Uh, that, that may involve us providing materials, say for a new batting cage at a baseball field, it could be a, a new parking lot, it could be um, you know, anything from an employee going to read a book to a kindergarten class. Uh, we do a whole lot of things, in, in not only monetarily, but involvement with the schools. Uh, Vulcan is also a very good company in terms of how they treat me, uh, the employees. We have uh, numerous opportunities for internships, mentoring, uh, matching gifts program, uh, you name it. Uh, they, they really go above and beyond to, uh, to keep us educated and keep us professionally uh, developing. All right, so what for most of you came here for today, we'll talk a little bit about Black Point now. Uh, as mentioned, I'm with Vulcan. Our co-proponent is Morian Resources. Mike McDonald's here, and then we've we've also assembled quite a spectacular team of uh, Nova Scotian consultants. I think Russell is in the back with SLR. Uh, we've utilized uh, AMEC for some of our First Nation engagements, uh, Black Point Engineering for a marine design terminal. Uh, so I, I commend uh, the talent that you have in Nova Scotia. It's been a it's been a very impressive. All right, to give you a quick overview, uh, this is a granite quarry with a deep water marine terminal, uh, annual sales economy uh, allowing, approximately three to five million tons per year. Uh, that would be a peak production rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of seven million tons. Uh, estimated reserves are a little over 400 million tons. Uh, those are proven. Uh, we have drilled those uh, with another contractor I forgot to mention, Logan, that did the drilling for us. Uh, so we. We have proven reserves there. Uh, that's not to say that that deposit doesn't go further. Project lifespan is approximately 50 years at the current design. A little bit of on the money side of details. Uh, we're looking at initial capital expenditure of 80 to $110 million. Uh, may go up a little bit from there. Anticipated uh, employment, this is a question that we've received many, many times, uh, especially in the, in the area of Guysboro, is during the peak or during the construction of the actual site itself, building the, the crushing plant, the facility, the marine terminal, we're looking at 120 to 150 direct, indirect jobs. During full-time production, we're looking at 50 to 60 jobs, um, which has been a, a real positive thing to the community up there, that that's the number they keep asking. Uh, annual expenditures will be approximately nine to $15 million. All right, we'll do a little dive into the site here. And uh, if you're familiar with the area or have ever been to Stanfest, you have driven by it. Um, it's about 15 kilometers uh, to the west of Stan uh, uh, Canso, a couple kilometers uh, from Fox Island there. Uh, it sits on Marine Drive. It's uh, buffered from Marine Drive. You can see with the red outline there that, uh, we'll go over a little more detail here. Uh, we'll, actually, we'll, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, some side characters that, characteristics, uh, thin overburden, uh, virtually no overburden. Uh, what you see there is rock and pretty much everywhere you go. Unless you get stuck in a, a bush, uh, you're, you're on rock everywhere. Um, the core that you're looking over on the right, um, we're, we're gonna call it a granite, but in reality, it's Muscovite biotite Luco Monzo granite uh, for us geologists in the room. Um, one unique thing about this, when I brought uh, a mining engineer up to the site, that uh, if you look at the first half meter of drilling and look at the last 120 meters of drilling, it looks exactly the same. It's a superior quality aggregate. Um, it behaves very well in testing. Uh, don't see any issues with it there. More importantly on the site here, you're looking to the north here, or to the south, I'm sorry. Uh, it's deep, ice-free wa ice water here on Chetabucto Bay. Uh, the, the, the coastline there slopes very quickly, uh, so which makes it ideal for this uh, type of activity. All right, look a little bit at the site details. Again, first thing that's going to have to happen is uh, build a road, entrance road uh, from Marine Drive. That'll be approximately 800 meters. Uh, the quarry throughout its lifespan, 50 years or even longer, uh, you will probably never even know it's there. Um, it's, it's well hidden behind, uh, behind the undulating hills. Uh, the site itself is approximately 95 meters in elevation there at the top. Um, find the pointer in this area here is approximately 95 meters slopes down to here uh, with a pretty abrupt cliff here um, down to about 22 meters uh, the red line represents the ultimate pit boundary and we'll just keep that in reference we're going to look at the mine plan here in just a minute um, we've got uh, primary 
crushing station here, which will be located inside the pit with the surge feed belt conveyor, if you will, down to the plant. We'll take a look uh, briefly at the plant. I know I don't want to bore you with all the engineering details and stuff, but uh, we'll do, we will take a quick look at that uh, as well as the marine terminal. We'll have an administrative facility over here, which will include maintenance shop, office, lunchroom, restrooms, washrooms, sorry, um, and so forth. All right, some of the recent activities, we've been very busy over the last year. Um, it's, and as Russell can, and Mike can uh, agree with, it's, it's been very busy. Uh, we've done plenty of field, different field studies. We've done everything from hydro studies to wetlands studies, archeological studies, MEKS, uh, just recently finished the mainland moose study. Um, I don't think we did a bat study. I don't think we had to do that one. Um, but the, all the others, we, we hit them all. Um, we've obviously done plenty of data collection, many different designs. Uh, we'll look at those, some of those in a few minutes. We've uh, consulted and engaged with just about anybody and everybody in Guysboro, uh, both from the local residents to our neighbors, to uh, the schools, to uh, fishermen. Uh, particularly, we've, we've spent a lot of time with the uh, Guysboro Inshore Fisheries Association. They've been a very, very helpful group to us. Um, I think our relationship is really developing. Um, and it's been very positive. We've had uh, numerous site visits, uh, both with regulators uh, as well as First Nations. Um, those have been very helpful as well, just to take people to the site and show them uh, and, and explain to them the process. We've also uh, created a community liaison committee, which has been very successful. We've had two meetings so far. Uh, we'll have another one in January. We've had one open house at the beginning of the project filing. Uh, we will be having another open house in. Uh, in January, uh, that will be during the public comment period of, of, of the EIS report. All right, some of the field activities, obviously we've done uh, many, many groundwater samples, uh, water level measurements, et cetera. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out about the shipping route here is that um, we had, I think I can point to this one a little easier. Initially, our captains uh, had designed the, tri the route out this direction into the main shipping channel. Uh, we showed that to the Inshore Fishery Association. They had real hard at heartburn about it. And, uh, but once we got to talking about them, they, they suggested, hey, why don't, what, you know, these guys out here are shrimp, shrimp fishing, and there's a trough right here. And so you'll see that they suggested that we come back around that trough. Hey, they'll lose less fishing gear, and, and you know, it doesn't hurt us at all. And in fact, our captains uh, preferred this route even more so than the first one. So. Uh, just that, that communication, open dialogue with those guys has really gone a long way. We'll look at the designs here in just a second. Uh, this is just the main plant. All right, we'll look here at the mine plan. Uh, don't sweat all the details and the words and stuff if you're, if you're really curious about it. When our uh, report is finalized in the next couple of weeks and submitted, you can see all these figures in gory detail. But again, uh, just to go over a little bit, we'll have the entrance road coming from Marine Drive down and around to the site. It's approximately two and a half kilometers long. Uh, at the beginning of site development, we will uh, be building the plant material there. We'll be using site materials to build this. Uh, we will have um, some portable plants that'll be capable of, you know, initially 1,000 tons per hour. That'll go up by adding more components to it as, as we move along. Um, what you'll notice here in the, in the drawings here is we will proceed mining in this in the uh, north uh, east corner of the of the, of the site, and then we will proceed westward before going southward. Um, one thing to notice is all the finds or all the uh, material that's not sellable, if you will, uh, it will be stored in site on the site. It does make somewhat of a handling challenge, but uh, it, it is doable, uh, and we think that's the best way to go about this site. All right. All right, here's the plant site. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, this is phase five. So this, this is probably somewhere once construction, or actually once uh, construction and mining begins, this is probably looking at around 10 years down the road. Uh, what you'll see here is we've got uh, duplicate plants here. We'll put one of these structures in first. Uh, when sales and production needs warrant, We'll duplicate that on the other side. All stockpiles will be out located in this area, and then they'll be uh, conveyed over to the terminal itself. Uh, one thing to notice here and, and point out to you that uh, 
again, with conversations with fishermen, which I think has been a very beneficial thing for us, is the, their concern with siltation, and rightfully so. But uh, as part of this design, uh, this plant is sloped from this direction this to here to capture any type of runoff. We'll go into the ponds themselves. Uh, I didn't show them, point them out in particular, but uh, in these areas here, there'll be over 100, 100 million gallon sump. Uh, this will be a closed water system. So this, uh, you know, we plan on capturing the water and using it over and over and over and over. So that's, a, that's been a big, big thing for us. Um, a little bit just to show you the design of the marine terminal. Again, this was done by East Point. This is our preliminary design. We looked at uh, several ways to do this, whether it was just strictly with caissons and dolphins or with the rubble mounds. And then ultimately we decided that a combination of the two is the best way to go. So we have a rubble mound approach here uh, that will uh, allow us maintenance activities as well. So there will be a small little road that you could drive a vehicle, maintenance vehicle, uh, on and off the ship, et cetera. Uh, you've got three different caissons, 11 slewing rails. You've got a radial arm here that will extend approximately 100, I think it's about 136 meters once it's fully extended. Uh, it'll have a capacity of approximately 5,000 tons per hour. So the ships will be loaded somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to 18 hours. Uh, again, 70,000 tons. All right, just a few of the other engagement activities that uh, we've done over the last while. Um, we've, like I said, mentioned earlier, we've had our community liaison committee. Uh, that's been very good. We've, uh, we've got members not only from the local community, uh, but we've got uh, two local fishermen on the committee. We also have a representative from the Shubenacadie uh, that have that have participated as well. Uh, we've done several school presentations just a couple, about a month or so ago. Uh, we spent the afternoon at Canso Academy, which I believe is now, I can't remember the name of it, uh, Hart, Harding, Harding, somebody help me out, Fanning, Fanning Academy. Uh, we, we spoke with uh, the ninth and 12th graders there uh, about job opportunities, what type of uh, the project itself and job opportunities. Uh, and then we spent an hour or so with the fourth graders, which was even more entertaining. Um, we've uh, been to numerous site visits. Uh, this is uh, looking uh, back towards the site. The site is way out in the distance there. Uh, that's essentially our closest neighbor, uh, which is a couple kilometers away, which is a nice thing as well. Uh, we've also had an open house. Like I said, we hit, our first open house was back in April. We had over 200 people in attendance, uh, which I, that blew me away. Uh, I really was not expecting that. I don't think anyone from Vulcan really was. Uh, but it was very good. We had two different sessions, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. Uh, and again, we will be planning on having another one of those, uh, I believe it's January 15th, January 16th, uh, coming up here soon. So if you're, uh, if you're in the neck, that neck of the woods, please stop by and say hello. Just to kind of give you an idea of where we stand with our timeline, uh, we, we've moved, oops, sorry. There we are. We're in the, this time frame right here. We have currently submitted a draft, uh, both to, to the agencies as well as the First Nation groups, uh, the KMK and Shubenacadie, uh, to get their feedback on a draft, and we should have those comments back towards the end of this month uh, and look to finalize that uh, report in mid-December and get that submitted. So hopefully, uh, if all works out properly, uh, we're looking at somewhere in the third quarter of next year of having uh, approval for the project. So that is it. I do appreciate your time. If you do have any other questions, I, I will direct you to the blackpointquarry.ca website. Uh, everything and anything that we've produced is located on that site, and uh, we look forward to talking and getting more comments from you guys. Thank you very much.